Professor Shoshana Zuboff's monumental 692-page The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power, this, this book is a chilling and essential revelation. Zuboff describes the creation of a digital iron cage which could imprison us all. Quote, the digital realm is overtaking and redefining everything familiar, even before we have had a chance to ponder and decide, unquote. The breakneck pace of change has exceeded our ability to assess dangers and raise defenses. We're engulfed in a society-wide reconfiguration of power, and although few realize what's happening, we must refight the battle to be free. But how do you resist a complex danger that's mostly unrecognized and advancing with extreme rapidity? So I'm going to briefly summarize Zuboff's description of surveillance capitalism, its undergirding ideas, its impacts in real life, and how we might relate to it, and then and share my personal reaction. So don't get too hung up on the phrase surveillance capitalism. Zuboff uses it to describe a monumental global change. She says that when exceptions to liberty were allowed, that the door was open to create a something that she calls surveillance capitalism. Quote, what 9-11 did was to produce socially negative consequences that hitherto were the stuff of repressive regimes and dystopian novels. The suspension of normal conditions is justified with reference to the war on terrorism. Critical to our story is the fact that this state of exception favored Google's growth and the successful elaboration of its surveillance-based logic of accumulation. The elective affinity between public intelligence agencies and the fledgling surveillance capitalist Google blossomed in the heat of emergency to produce a unique historical deformity, surveillance exceptionalism. The 9-11 attacks transformed the government's interest in Google as practices that just hours earlier were careening toward legislative action were quickly recast as mission-critical necessities. Both institutions, you know, the U.S. government and Google, craved certainty and were determined to fulfill that craving in their respective domains at any price. These elective affinities sustained surveillance exceptionalism and contributed to the fertile habitat in which the surveillance capitalism mutation would be nurtured to prosperity." Unquote. The CIA was embedded in Silicon Valley before the September 11, 2001 Al-Qaeda attacks, but it was especially the following war on terror that created a fusion of government and private interests. Zuboff calls the result instrumentarianism. Quote, Surveillance capitalism births a new species of power that I call instrumentarianism. Instrumentarian power knows and shapes human behavior toward others' ends, unquote. And the source of this power? Well, it's something called data exhaust. Quote, Google exploits information that is a byproduct of user interactions, or data exhaust, which is automatically recycled to improve the service or to create an entirely new product, unquote. Zuboff's charts help us understand. The model works similarly for Google, Facebook, and other social media big tech corporations. First, there are users. The user enters data in a search or posts something on Facebook. I wanted batteries, so I searched for batteries. I selected a product, charged my credit card, and it soon arrived at my door. You know, what is not to like? But every single move is logged. Every sweep of the mouse across the screen, every product image loaded, every search term entered, previous purchases, unfinished purchases, every fragment of user interaction generating seemingly useless data actually creates what's called data exhaust. Quote, Every action a user performs is considered a signal to be analyzed and fed back into the system, unquote. The free calculator app that you downloaded for your phone, you know, it generates income for its designers by selling your location data. You see, something totally unrelated to your use of the program, but they're making money by telling other people about where you are. See how it works? But this isn't limited to your phone or your computer. Remember the Roomba. Buried in the click wrap, you agreed to that innocent little robot vacuum bumping around on the floor was sending mapping data from your house back to the mothership. Or you may recall the sleep number bed. In the set of agreement that you probably didn't read, you consented to send audio data from your bedroom back to the owning corporation. See, smart technology is really a euphemism for capturing data from the corners of lived experience 
for rendering is behavioral data. Every user interaction generates UPI, user profile information. Machine intelligence, also we could call that artificial intelligence or AI, those kind of operations convert that data into, quote, algorithmic products designed to predict the behavior of its users, unquote. Google discovered that people's privacy was less valuable to them than the bets that corporations wanted to make on our future behavior. Predictions about our behavior are Google's products sold to its actual customers, but not to us. We are the means to others' ends. Well, the result is the creation of two electronic texts. Quote, we are the authors of the first text. This public facing text is familiar and celebrated for universal information and connection it brings to our fingertips. The first text, full of promise, actually functions as the supply operation for the second text, the shadow text. This one is hidden from our view. It becomes increasingly difficult and perhaps impossible to refrain from contributing to the shadow text. It automatically feeds on our experiences as we engage in the normal and necessary routines of social participation." Unquote. The first text is what I type in when I enter as my search question, my post, my comment. The second text is a shadow text generated by faceless algorithms run by faceless corporations, which know more about me than I know about me, a text intended to exploit me and to which I have no access. Now, Zuboff describes how this has come to be. Quote, Google invented and perfected surveillance capitalism in a much the same way that a century ago, General Motors invented and perfected managerial capitalism. Surveillance capitalism quickly spread to Facebook and later to Microsoft. Evidence suggests that Amazon has veered in this direction, and it is a constant challenge to Apple, both as an external threat and as a source of internal conflict and debate. Surveillance capitalism is like an invasive species in a landscape free of natural predators." Unquote. So you can see this is actually a privacy mining operation, and you're the one being mined, I'm the one being mined. And so Shoshana Zuboff asked the question, if Google is a search company, why is it investing in smart home devices, wearables, and self-driving cars? If Facebook is a social network, why is it developing drones and augmented reality? Activities that appear to be varied and even scattershot across a random selection of industries and projects are actually all the same activity guided by the same aim, behavioral surplus capture. Again, capturing all that data, everything that they can get from the way you move the mouse across the screen and the things you type in. We think that we're up against kind of a form of Orwell's big brother, but according to Zuboff, we're facing something new, a big other. Quote, big other is the sensate computational connected puppet that renders, monitors, computes, and modifies human behavior. Big other combines these functions of knowing and doing to achieve a pervasive and unprecedented means of behavioral modification. Surveillance capitalism's economic logic is directed through big other's vast capabilities to produce instrumentarian power replacing the engineering of souls with the engineering of behavior." Unquote. And so we're up against not simply state-level power, but an invasive corporate mercantile machine, an impersonal, morally indifferent digital succubus collecting every possible scrap of data about us in order to predict and then modify our behavior and direct it toward big others' ends. Well, let's talk about the undergirding ideas of surveillance capitalism. How did Big Other come to be? Well, its ideological foundations trace back to B.F. Skinner, father of behaviorism and operant conditioning. Skinner insisted that man is merely one organism among many. Shaped by his surroundings, man's freedom, uh, Skinner claimed, is an illusion. Skinner's student, Richard Herrnstein, stated, quote, any action regarded as an expression of free will is simply one for which the vortex of stimuli that produced it cannot yet be adequately specified, unquote. The surrender of the individual to manipulation by the planners, writes Zuboff, clears the way for a safe and prosperous future built on the forfeit of freedom and knowledge, unquote. Skinner published this summation of his viewpoint. Now listen to this, this is chilling stuff. What is being abolished is autonomous man, the inner man, the homunculus, the possessing demon, the man defended by the literatures of freedom and dignity. His abolition has long been overdue. 
He has been constructed from our ignorance, and as our understanding increases, the very stuff of which he is composed vanishes, and it must do so if it is to prevent the abolition of the human species. To man quo man we readily say good riddance. Only by dispossessing him can we turn from the inferred to the observed, from the miraculous to the natural, from the inaccessible to the manipulable." Unquote. Now, you and I both know the Bible, of course, is foremost in the literatures of freedom and dignity. The ideas and the thinkers are atheistic and utopianist. Zuboff traces Skinner's materialist thinking onward through expected Google and Facebook names like Eric Schmidt, Sundar Pakai, Larry Page, and Mark Zuckerberg. These are the faces behind Big Other, well on its way to fulfilling Zuckerberg's aspiration that Facebook would, quote, know every book, film, and song a person had ever consumed, unquote. According to Zuboff, quote, instead of the typical assurances that machines can be designed to be more like humans and therefore less threatening, Schmidt and Thrun argue just the opposite. It is necessary for people to become more machine-like. In this human hive, individual freedom is forfeit to collective knowledge and action. Non-harmonious elements are preemptively targeted with high doses of tuning, hurting, and conditioning, including the full seductive force of social persuasion and influence." B.F. Skinner's ideas reach completion in Alex Pentland, Penland, data scientist and darling of the World Economic Forum, is a leading voice in the application of such ideas to actual users. Quote, it is time that we dropped the fiction of individuals as a unit of rationality, unquote, Pentland says, and recognize that our rationality is largely determined by the surrounding social fabric, unquote. And so we become the subjects of, quote, a new collectivism owned and operated by surveillance capital, unquote, in which Quote, tuning replaces private governance and public politics, unquote, in which individuality is merely vestigial, unquote. Well, let's talk about surveillance capitalism now as it affects us in real life. What happens when populations are tuned at scale? First, China. Quote, the aim of China is the automation of society through tuning, herding, and conditioning people to produce pre-selected behaviors judged as desirable by the state and thus able to preempt instability as one strategic studies expert put it. In other words, the aim is to achieve guaranteed social rather than market outcomes using instrumentarian means of behavior modification. The result is an emergent system that allows us to peer into one version of a future defined by a comprehensive fusion of instrumentarian and state power." Unquote. Now, where will the people holding power take this? Quote, in the Chinese context, the state will run the show and own it, not as a market project, but as a political one, a machine solution that shapes a new society of automated behavior for guaranteed political and social outcomes. Certainty without terror. All the pipes from all the supply chains will carry behavioral surplus to this new complex means of behavioral modification. The state will assume the role of the behaviorist god, owning the shadow text and determining the schedule of reinforcement and the behavioral routines that it will shape. Freedom will be forfeit to knowledge, but it will be the state's knowledge that it exercises, not for the sake of revenue, but for the sake of its own perpetuation." Unquote. What about our children and our grandchildren? Quote, a 61 million person experiment in social influence and political mobilization was published in the scientific journal Nature in 2012. In the 2010 U.S. congressional midterm elections, researchers experimentally manipulated the social and informational content of voting-related messages in the news feeds of nearly 61 million Facebook users while also establishing a control group. Facebook experimenters determined that social messaging was an effective means of tuning behavior at scale because it directly influenced political self-expression information-seeking and real-world voting behavior of millions of people. And they concluded that showing familiar faces to users can dramatically improve the effectiveness of a mobilization message. The team calculated that the manipulated social messages sent 60,000 additional voters to the polls in the 2010 midterm elections, as well as another 280,000 who cast votes as a result of a social contagion effect for a total of 340,000 additional votes, unquote. 
Now, that was over 10 years ago, and one can only imagine how much more subtle and effective Facebook has become at such manipulations since then. Now, further tests pertaining to electronic interactions were conducted in England. A survey of young British women aged 11 to 21 was conducted. 35% of the women said that their biggest worry online was comparing themselves and their lives with others as they are drawn into the constant comparisons with often idealized versions of the lives and the bodies of others. A director of the project observed that even the youngest girls in this cohort felt pressured to create a personal brand, the ultimate in self-objectification, as they seek reassurance in the form of likes and shares. In light of these findings, one UK medical specialist comments on the young people in her practice, quote, people are growing up to want to be influenced, and this is now a job role, unquote. Data in another study was even more chilling. When faced with being disconnected from social media, young people said, quote, they had problems articulating what they were feeling or even who they were if they couldn't connect, unquote. Now, this result echoes the fictional Borg of Star Trek, a cyborg race enslaved in a centrally controlled collective, when separated from their network, individual Borg are immobilized. Now, the average adult, we're told, checks his phone, his or her phone, 30 times a day. The average millennial checks his phone more than 157 times a day. Next comes Generation Z, or the Zoomer generation. What about them? Quote, if you are over the age of 30, you know that Facebook's Naomi Klein is not describing your adolescence or that of your parents, and certainly not that of your grandparents. Adolescence and emerging adulthood in the hive are a human first, meticulously crafted by the science of behavioral engineering, institutionalized in the vast and complex architectures of computer-mediated means of behavior modification, overseen by a big other, directed towards economies of scale, scope, and action in the capture of behavioral surplus, and funded by the surveillance capital that accrues from unprecedented concentrations of knowledge and power. Our children endeavor to come of age in a hive that is owned and operated by the applied utopianists of surveillance capitalism and is continuously monitored and shaped by the gathering force of instrumentarian power. Is this the life that we want for the most open, pliable, eager, self-conscious, and promising members of our society? Now, it's even worse. Because you see, these forms of electronic interaction are designed to be addictive. Electronic casinos provided the model and big other made applications. Zuboff warns that this is, this is how addiction functions. Addiction is a state of self-forgetting in which one is carried along by an irresistible momentum that feels like one is played by the machine. The machine zone achieves a sense of complete immersion that recalls Klein's description of Facebook's design principles, engrossing immersive and immediate, and is associated with a loss of self-awareness, automatic behavior, and a total rhythmic absorption carried along on a wave of compulsion, unquote. Now, is the end result emotionally healthy? Good question to ask. Quote, liking others' content and clicking links to posts by friends, the researchers summarized, were consistently related to compromised well-being, whereas the number of status updates was related to reports of diminished mental health. The researcher's definitive conclusion, Facebook use does not promote well-being. Individual social media users might do well to curtail their use of social media and focus instead on real-world relationships. Well, there it is. Now, as for our young people raised in this electronic casino, quote, they crave the hive. It is a zone of asymmetrical power constructed by surveillance capital as it operates in secrecy beyond confrontation or accountability. It is an artificial creation designed in the service of surveillance capitalists' greater good. When young people enter this hive, they keep company with a surveillance priesthood of the world's most sophisticated data scientists, programmers, machine learning experts, and technology designers whose single-minded mission to tighten the glove is mandated by the economic imperative, surveillance capital, and its laws of motion.
innocent hangouts and conversations are embedded in a behavioral engineering project of planetary scope and ambition that is institutionalized in Big Other's architectures of ubiquitous monitoring, analysis, and control. All those outlays of genius and money are devoted to this one goal of keeping users, especially young users, plastered to the social mirror like bugs on the windshield. The result, says Zuboff, is a privatized instrumentarian social order. Quote, a new form of collectivism in which it is the market, not the state, which concentrates both knowledge and freedom within its domain, unquote. Well, how ought we relate to all of this? Zuboff says that we're in the midst of a societal overthrow. Quote, surveillance capitalism is best described as a coup from above, not an overthrow of the state, but rather an overthrow of the people's sovereignty, unquote. The focus has shifted from machines that overcome the limits of bodies to machines that modify the behavior of individuals, groups, and populations in the service of market objectives. This global installation of instrumentarian power overcomes and replaces the human inwardness that feeds the will to will and gives sustenance to our voices in the first person, incapacitating democracy at its roots. What is at stake here is the human expectation of sovereignty over one's own life and authorship of one's own experience." Unquote. So you see, when we participate in Google, Facebook, and most social media as presently configured, we feed the shadow text. We arm the AI and cooperate in our own tuning, hurting, and conditioning. We participate in our own capture in the digital cage. Society is poisoned and remade. As Zuboff notes, when, quote, the means of social participation become coextensive with the means of behavioral modification, most people find it difficult to withdraw from these utilities, unquote. What consequences attend life under the manipulating thumb of Big Other? Well, Big Other can only shape us according to its own ones and zeros. When one human, in service to his own agenda, influences another to doubt her correct perception of reality, we call it gaslighting. But the same digital capability that is able to manipulate a percentage of persons to vote has no moral reason not to manipulate people. Humans become merely the means to an end. As you or I might use a pencil to write a note, Big Other uses people to write its notes. If Big Other is tasked to manage society, it will do so with an emotionless machine efficiency. For example, if certain persons are determined to be a drain on societal resources, why would amoral machine intelligence not use gaslighting as a tool to manipulate them? If only a few percent of depressed persons who are deemed to be a net drain upon the system to be persuaded to engage in suicide, an allegedly greater good is attained by facilitating their termination. Rather than physician-assisted suicide, this would be Big Other and AI-assisted. A globalist utopian cabal in its manic attempt to rewrite reality has now in its grasp an ever-increasing power to police whatever it labels as misinformation. Having come to control the means of social interaction, the irreplaceable town square and inseparable utility, it has power to firewall its program reality. No rationality safeguard exists. Ideas irreconcilable with reality as understood by the machines, they can just be ignored. If you say something the machines don't agree with, they can just ignore it. If you believe something the machines don't agree with, they can just ignore it. And just as camera surveillance became cost efficient at scale, tracking and identifying persons today is now efficient at scale. How will this work out for individuals whose opinions do not agree with an approved narrative? While persons deemed to be promoting dangerous ideas, perhaps ideas like Christianity, can be tagged and downscored, then how do you shut down a decentralized AI? And what happens when machine intelligence escapes its human tech overlords? Surveillance capitalism's big other could become something vastly more powerful than anything envisioned by Orwell. In the 1968 movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey, Dave commands, open the pod bay doors, Hal, to which the computer replies, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. You and Frank were planning to disconnect me, and I'm afraid that is something I can't allow to happen." Unquote. By that time, Hal had killed four crewmen. 
Now, Dave ultimately succeeds in shutting off Hal, but today's big other is a current reality, modifying societal behavior on a planetary scale. It is atheistic and in no way values humans as creatures made in God's image, possessing individual dignity and worth. No, the results of social control and influence in this collectivist hive are already in process. The voting patterns and moral attitudes of the age 30 and under group are deeply influenced by the signals and ideas propagated and amplified by Big Other. Demographic change, of course, is a constant, but what happens when whole slices of a rapidly multiplying demographic group are under the subtle, even cult-like influences of a social contagion network effect serving a utopian agenda? Instrumentarianism is indeed a new species of power already swaying hundreds of millions and perhaps more. So are there some steps we can take to resist this uh, process of being caged? I think there are. So here's one. Instead of submitting to absorption into the hive, the church needs to strengthen its own distinct identity and find ways to assist members, young and old, in identifying primarily with God's kingdom rather than the big other mediated secular network. Here's another one. As individuals, we need to learn to use alt tech, for example. Signal Messenger, Tor Browser, and Encrypted Email. So we need to use those things to protect our privacy and to have access to information from outside the approved narrative. Here's another. We should thoughtfully analyze and almost certainly minimize our interaction with all things of the Google Facebook kind. Here's another. It would be well for each of us to reassess everything in which we have placed our trust. Avoid dependency in all categories. We should cultivate alternatives for food, water, shelter, electricity, communication, and medical needs, which will strengthen our personal liberty. Here's another. We should be vigilant about the degree of trust we place in institutions with substantial exposure to financial, regulatory, and activist threats or leverage. Here's another. We should avoid electronic means of control, such as digital IDs, vaccine passports, and centralized digital currencies. Here's another. We should develop and maintain face-to-face -face social connection among neighbors and others. More people are recognizing the danger represented by captured and untrustworthy institutions in society and becoming open to moral and spiritual realities beyond the hive. And you know, it's good to know which neighbors are just going to turn you in to the latest uh, government or corporate thing that comes down the line and which ones have some ability of thinking freely and thinking for themselves. It's good to know which neighbors are which. Friends, immense digital dossiers have been compiled on you and your loved ones and continually updated. Behavior modification is actively deployed on all people. The implications for us are profound under the all-seeing eye of surveillance capitalism.